All right, this is going to be uh, airway management and ventilation part two. And the area it's going to cover is pretty much rapid sequence innovation. Um, rapid sequence innovation inv involves the rapid sedation and paralyzation of a patient with the goal of increasing the likelihood of successful orotracheal innovations. And now indications of this are going to be pretty much impending respiratory failure, secondary to pulmonary disease, some of these pulmonary disease listings here are COPD, asthma, congestive heart failure, and or pneumonia. Acute airway disorders, threatening airway patency, uh, airway burns, um, laryngeal upper airway trauma, epiglottitis, altered mental status with significant risk of vomiting and or aspiration. That would be with a patient with a Glasgow glaucoma scale less than eight alcohol intoxication, drug intoxication, or status epilepticus. Now, whenever using this clinical indication of status epilepticus, we can paralyze the skeletal muscle with this. However, the patient may still be having a seizure in their brain. Um, great consideration should be taken whenever using this for one seizure after another after another. RSI Pharmacology. Four phases we're going to talk about here. We're going to talk about induction, premedication, neuromuscular blockade, and then maintenance therapy. Induction agents are used to provide sedation before paralysis. Um, neuromuscular blocking agents do not affect mental status. So uh, the drugs do exactly what we're asking them to do. The neuromuscular blocking agents pretty much paralyze the skeletal muscle, but they do nothing to depress the patient's mental status. So if you, you essentially, when using a neuromuscular blocking agent without sedation, lock them into a body, they can still feel all the pain. They're completely aware of their surroundings. Um, sedation induces unconsciousness, so the, the patient cannot appreciate what's going on, or respond to what's going on, or even recall the event. And we generally use hypnotics for this, or benzodiazepines, which we'll talk about. Uh, many agents used pretty much in emergency medicine. Barbiturates and other hypnotics. Uh, thiopental sodium, or pentothal, is pretty much a short-acting barbiturate and CNS depressant. The onset action of this is going to be about 10 to 20 seconds. Duration of the effects is going to last about 5 to 10 minutes, and the dose is going to be 2 to 5 milligrams per kilogram IV. Uh, significant hemodynamic effects. This does have a nasty little habit about giving us some hypotension or low blood pressure. Um, however, it does decrease ICP, which makes it pretty much ideal for head injuries. Atomidate or amidate, a uh, short-acting non-barbiturate hypnotic agent. This has a nice, uh, nice effect of depressing their CNS to the point where they can no longer load memory. Uh, attractive, safe profile. Onset action is going to be in about 10 to 20 seconds. Duration of the effect is going to be about 5 minutes. Uh, dose is going to be 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Most standard dosing is at 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. And we want to give it over about 15 to 30 seconds. Um, if we give it too rapidly, we could get some nasty side effects. The patient can vomit. Um, they can get something called myclonus. Uh, too low of a dose can actually cause trismus, which would um, directly affect our ability to intubate the patient. Profofol or Diprovan, milk of amnesia, uh, good long-term rapid induction may cause profound hypotension though. So whenever we're looking at Diprovan, we should really consider anybody with a cardiac history that we may worry about their hemodynamics later on, we may not want to use Diprovan. Uh, onset of action is going to be in about 10 to 20 seconds. Duration of the effect is going to be in about 10 to 15 minutes. And the dose is generally one to three milligrams per kilogram as a bolus. Opiates. Uh, the thought process behind opiates is, is whenever you're inducing somebody or performing a rapid sequence intubation, the actual neuromuscular blocking agents do nothing for the pain receptor, so they still feel all the pain. Um, so just a empathetic thing to do to your patient 
is to give them a little bit of pain meds. It also helps with the induction. Uh, fentanyl comes to the top of our list, a acting opiate. It's a synthetic opiate, uh, chemically unrelated to morphine, uh, widely used in anesthesia. Uh, onset of action is pretty much immediate. Uh, duration of action is going to be 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, dose on this is 2 to 10 mics per kilogram IV. Uh, if administered too rapidly, you can get chest wall rigidity or skeletal muscle rigidity. Uh, so you want to give this nice and slow over about a minute. Morphine, uh, less potent and less effective than fentanyl. Hemodynamic properties make it kind of unattractive. It can give us some nasty hypotension. Onset of action is going to be in about three to five minutes, and the duration is going to be about two to seven hours. Uh, dose is going to be 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram IV. Neuroleptic agents. Uh, ketamine or Ketalar as a dissociative drug, and what this drug essentially does is unplug your upper brain from your lower brain. Uh, it used pretty much in pediatric anesthesia or veterinary medicine applications. A patient appears wide awake, uh, is deeply anesthetized. It causes a catecholamine release, which we'll talk about here in just a second. This is going to be one of your ideal meds. Uh, for a patient having status asthmaticus. It increases sympathetic nervous tone to the entire system, increases heart rate, cardiac output, and blood pressure. Uh, onset of action is going to be about 45 to 60 seconds. Uh, duration of action is going to be about 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, dose on this is going to be 1 to 4 milligrams per kilogram. Most of the time I've seen dosings at 2 milligrams per kilogram, uh, but you can extend that up to 4 milligrams per kilogram. It's ideal for asthmatics and hemodynamically unstable patients, and that's because we give them a little bit of increase in sympathetic tone, and what that does is that increases our cardiac output and or causes them to have bronchial dilation. Benzodiazepines. Midazolam or Versed. Popular induction agent for the pre-hospital rapid sequence innovation, and it has great amnesic effects, potent amnesic effects, two to four times more potent than diazepam or Valium. Onset of action is in about one to two minutes. Duration of action is going to be 30 to 60 minutes. The dose on this is going to be 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Now, as a one drug knockdown agent, you can give a patient this much Versed. However, I want to make note to this, that the higher the dosing on Versed, the greater chance that you have to go into cardiovascular collapse. It does have some nasty side effects at the higher doses. It can make you hemodynamically unstable. Um, but I will assure you that 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of Versed will initiate a rapid uh, or an induction, pharmacology-assisted intubation. Um, for a 100 kilogram patient, that would be 30 milligrams of Versed, which mostly is more than we generally carry on the trucks in one setting. So the point on this is, is that we can use other agents that are specifically designed for this. Diazepam or Valium, feature similar to midazolam, uh, not soluble in water, it's pretty much less potent, great potential for hypotension. Onset of action is in two to four minutes. Uh, duration of effect is going to be in about 30 to 90 minutes. Uh, doses are 0 0.25 to 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. That is a large amount of Valium. 100 kilogram patient would receive 40 milligrams of Valium. Sticking closer to this range here, or a 10 milligram total dose might be more appropriate. Lorazepam, long-acting benzodiazepine, useful for long-term sedation after intubation. Onset of action is in about one to five minutes, so you can't rapidly do this. This is going to, this is going to onset in about a minute after you, you've given it to someone. Duration of action is going to be about one to two hours. Doses on this are going to be 50 mics per kilogram IV.
pre-medication. So in the pre-medication section, what we tend to look at is, is that whenever we perform the uh, intubation with our neuromuscular blocking agents, we may need to prep the environment just a little bit. Uh, patient conditions may demand the use of some medications before administering of the neuromuscular blocking agent. Pre-medications serve to do a couple things. They decrease the physiology responses to the neuromuscular blockers, and they decrease the physiological responses to laryngoscopy and intubation. Uh, decrease autonomic nervous system stimulation caused by stimulation of the afferent receptors in the posterior pharynx, the hypopharynx, and the larynx. One of these medications that comes high on our list, and this would be in the case of trauma, is going to be lidocaine or xylocaine, uh, thought to prevent the rise in intracranial pressure. Lidocaine is a sodium channel blocker. Uh, it essentially has the same mechanism of action as dilantin. However, it does work both in the CNS and systemically. Um, if the patient has a head injury with signs and symptoms of intracranial pressure, it might behoove us to give them a loading dose of lidocaine. However, we should also take into effect that lidocaine is going to affect their heart as well. Uh, suppresses the cough reflexes and increases airway resistance. Uh, dysrhythmia control. Dose on this is going to be 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Can be sprayed directly on the vocal cords when spasm exists. If the patient is having a laryngeal spasm, lidocaine in a autoject version or the kind that we would normally give in a full arrest can be sprayed directly onto the vocal cords. This is going to decrease um, them from spasming or stop the spasm. One more additional thing on lidocaine. If you have viscous lidocaine and use it as a lubricant for your tube, that will do the same thing for the laryngeal spasm. Atropine <clears throat> reduces hypoxic and anectine or laryngoscope induced bradycardia. And this is going to be sucks. Um, sucks is essentially two acetylcholine molecules that we make synthetically. Um, bradycardia is very potential, a very high potential hazard in children. Um, indicates indications indicated in all patients less than 10 years old uh, will also help dry oral secretions and this is because it's an anticholinergic administered two minutes before intubation attempts and the dose on this should be 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram to a maximum of three which should be our adult dose defasciculating dose now a lot of people get confused on this one um, a defasciculating dose, one of the things that succinylcholine, and this one right here, anectine or sucks, is the only depolarizing, the only depolarizing paralytic that we have. And it works different than any other neuromuscular blocking agent. Um, the way that it works, and how it causes the fasciculations can actually give us more problems. If the patient has oh, large amounts of tissue damage or if the patient has the possibility of, of herniating their brain stem because of high intracranial pressure the fasciculations are not really going to be a good thing. So we utilize a defasciculating dose to hamper the fasciculations that would occur through the use of this medicine here, which is a nectine or succinylcholine. A defasciculating dose of neuromuscular blocking agent can attenuate fasciculations seen with a nectine use. All neuromuscular agents can be administered at a defasciculating dose, and that would be these right here. 
um, must be given before a nicotine is administered. And this is, we need to get this in and let this soak in for about a minute before we actually push our sucks. The defasciculating dose is generally 10% of the paralyzing dose. Neuromuscular blocking agents. Uh, we use these to facilitate endotracheal intubation. They pretty much paralyze the skeletal muscle. Uh, they do not affect the level of consciousness and they do not affect pain sensation. Specific agents that we're going to talk about here are a nectine, or sucks, pancuronium or pavulon, vex or norcuron, atricurium or tricurium, rocuronium or zimuron. How a neuromuscular blocking agent works? Uh, very simply, what it is blocking is the stimulation from the nerve tissue to the actual, actual muscle tissue. Now, it does this in two ways, and I'm going to, right here is where we're occurring. And I'm going to blank the screen here for a second, kind of draw this out a little simpler. So let's say that we have the muscle end and that this is our nerve. We have two types of neuromuscular blocking. One type, and this is the top one, is going to be the depolarizing. And the bottom one here is going to be non-depolarizing. So in the depolarizing paralytic, whenever we push succinylcholine, it binds to the receptors on this side. And what it essentially does is it keeps stimulating, stimulating them and causing action potentials to occur again and again and again for 10 minutes. That's why it's called a depolarizing paralytic. The non-depolarizing essentially, and I know I use the same marking here, but you'll get it, blocks off this end, doesn't depolarize it, but actually stops it from functioning for the onset of action, however long this, this, uh, however long this drug's half-life is. Some of them are 20 minutes, some of them are 60 minutes, it depends on the agent. These are going to be things like Vex, Pavilon, Rock, dot, dot, dot. We only have one depolarizing paralytic on the market, and it is sucks. Now, why don't we want fasciculations to occur? If a person has intracranial pressure, the tightening or the stimulus of the muscle could actually cause them to herniate. This is going to happen in their eyeballs as well. As well. So if the person has narrow angle glaucoma, we could blind them. Whenever a muscle contracts, we release potassium into the surrounding tissue, or the sodium potassium pump flips the potassium out. If they're already hyperkalemic, all of these can be complications. What the defasciculating dose does for us is it retards this end here and depresses it by a 10% dose of one of these agents that will decrease fasciculations, uh, that would also decrease uh, the possible complications in narrow angle of glaucoma. It would also decrease the possible complications with intracranial pressure. It is also politically correct. If family members are present whenever the induction occurs, these will look like spasms and or mild seizures to their extremities and their body. Um, the defasciculating dose is also a very politically correct thing to do.
depolarizing blocking agent. Anectine is the only depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent used widely in pre-hospital care. Mechanism of action differs from non-depolarizing agents. That's because it initiates little tiny action potentials and causes flaccidity because of overstimulation. Administered IV tends to have short periods of duration, which makes it ideal for rapid sequence intubation. Pharmacodynamics acts like acetylcholine, depolarizes the synaptic membrane at the neuromuscular junction. The muscle is excited and depolarizes contraction of the muscle fibers. Succinylcholine not inactivated by cholinesterase remains in acetylcholine receptor, continues to excite and depolarize the muscle, which gives us fasciculations, and then we get paralysis, and then the patient becomes flaccid. Non-depolarizing blocking agents. They pretty much compete uh, stabil competitive stabilizing agents. Most of these are curare alkaloids, or synthetic analogs of curare. They are administered IV, tend to have long durations of action, and they're used for long-term paralysis. Pharmacodynamics uh, compete with acetylcholine at cholinergic receptors at the neuromuscular junction, occupies receptors but does not activate. If it activated it, we would get an action potential. Effectively blocks receptors, does not allow acetylcholine to depolarize the membrane, and paralysis is achieved. Effects can be counteracted with neostigmine and peridiostigmine, and the reason is because it inhibits acetylcholinesterase. So what we're going to get is we're going to get an overpowering cholinergic response, which should overpower the neuromuscular blocking agent. Pre-hospital use of neuromuscular blocking agents. Succinylcholine or nectine, most widely used neuromuscular blocking agent. It's a depolarizing agent. It causes fasciculations before paralysis. This can increase intracranial pressure. Use a defasciculating dose of neuromuscular blocking agent to kind of alleviate this. It can elevate serum potassium levels, which can cause life-threatening hyperkalemia. Onset of action is in about 30 to 60 seconds. The duration of action is in 8 to 11 minutes. Dosing on sucks is going to be 1.5 milligrams per kilogram IV for the adult, 2 milligrams per kilogram in children less than 10 years of age. It takes about, we used to say 1 milligram per kilogram on the sucks. They have changed that now to 1.5. You're still seeing some literature 1 to 1.5, but the kids almost take twice as much to actually facilitate an intubation. Vecuronium or norcuron is a non-depolarizing agent. This is going to block, does not cause fasciculations, commonly used as a defasciculating agent before administering a nectine. The defasciculating dose is going to be 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Generally considered a second line paralytic if a nectine is contraindicated. Onset of actions, fairly rapid, two to three minutes. Duration of action is going to be about 45 minutes. Dose, 0.15 milligrams per kilogram. And if you'll notice, that's about one-tenth of the dose. Examples of this. Uh, a patient that weighs 100 kilograms is going to get 15 milligrams of X. A defasciculating dose, one-tenth of that, is going to be 1.5 milligrams. Atricurium or tricurium, non-depolarizing agent, does not cause fasciculations either. Useful in patients with liver and kidney disease. Not excreted via the renal or hepatic mechanisms. The onset of action on this is going to be 30 to 60 minutes. Duration of action is going to be 20 to 30 minutes. The dose on this is going to be 0.5 milligrams per kilogram IV. Pancuronium bromide or pavulon, non-depolarizing agent. Again, does not cause fasciculations. Advantage of rapid onset, offset by long duration of action. Can, can be dis, disadvantageous in instances of failed intubation. And this is why right here. 
onset of action is going to be in about three to five minutes. However, it's going to keep your patient down for about an hour. Dose on this is going to be 0 0.08 milligrams per kilogram IV. Rocuronium or Zimuron, non-depolarizing agent, again, does not cause fasciculations. Short onset of action makes it a good choice for patients with contraindication to a nectine or sucks. Onset of action, 30 to 60 seconds. Duration of action, 30 to 60 minutes. Dose on this is going to be 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram. And this is going to be both for adults and children. Maintenance medication. Uh, neuromuscular blocking agents do not affect mental status or pain sensations. Use of sedative amnesic medications, long-acting agents desirable uh, versus short-acting desirable during pre-medication. Uh, be careful for signs and symptoms of waning sedation or the, when their sedation is wearing off. And some easy indicators here are going to be tachycardia and an increased blood pressure. They're going to become immediately aware of how painful that intubation was. Long-acting neuromuscular blocking agents used to maintain paralysis. Non-depolarizing agents are desirable. Um, Pancuronium, Pavilon, Vex, or Rock all can be administered second time or as maintenance doses. Reversal agents. Rarely used in the pre-hospital setting and that's because of the uh, time to hospital is so short. Limited to non-depolarizing agents, there is no reversal agent for sucks. Inhibit acetylcholine esterase at the neuromuscular junction, and this prolongs the effects of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction. Increased acetylcholine receptor stimulation, which is kind of going to overpower uh, the long-acting or the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents. As far as the RSI procedure, we're going to kind of talk through this. We're going to pre-oxygenate. 100% oxygen is always awesome. Non-rebreather mask if the patient's breathing with adequate tidal volume. A BVM with BLS airway junks if indicated. If they still have a gag, nasopharyngeal is fine. Prepare your equipment, and you're going to have your intubation equipment out and ready to go. Backup or rescue airway. This is going to be things like a combi tube or a king. Also, you should probably have your surgical airway or your cricothrotomy equipment available. Two patent IV lines, cardiac monitor, pulse oximeter. Uh, your medications for this are already drawn up and labeled. Obviously, your patient. Explain the procedure to them. And identify any allergies or relevant history. Sucks has a five allergy or relevant contraindication list by itself to it. We'll talk about that more whenever we actually hit pharmacology. Begin induction, and this is where we're going to give our sedative agents, Valium, Versed. Please provide some analgesia. Uh, fentanyl is probably going to be at the top of our list for actually giving them an analgesic effect. Whenever they're sedated and they're pain-free, please provide a silix maneuver so in case they have Taco Bell on their belly, it doesn't form in the upper glottic region. Administer the pre-medication agents. Defasciculation in the presence of intracranial pressure or around family members is awesome. If we have a possibility of bradycardia in a child underneath the age of 10, please administer atropine. If you think they have intracranial pressure, lidocaine would probably be indicated. Administer the paralytic. Please check and double check the contraindications of this drug. This is a nectine or succinicoline. This is going to uh, cause paralyzation to occur within about a minute. Most people actually bring this up because this has about a 10 minute shelf life. However, in this version, it did not. Uh, adding the depolarizing agent, that's awful confident. Um, Vecuronium, Pavilon, Rocuronium. Depending on your downtime, this one would be the longest at 60 minutes. 
Um, like I said, most people initiate the sucks or give the inectine, initiate the innovation because they're already sedated, and then they add on board the non-depolarizing agent for however long that they want them innovated. Confirm endotracheal tube, auscultation. We're going to do this by uh, listening with a stethoscope, entitled tidal CO2, color metric device and or capnographic waveform, uh, pulse oximetry, release the silix maneuver at this time, and secure the endotracheal tube. Maintain sedation and paralysis. Long-term sedatives can be used for sedation. Remember, uh, your analgesia may wear off as well. We want to keep the patient in an amnesic area. Versed works quite nicely uh, to reinitiate that amnesic effect again and again and again. Long-term neuromuscular blocking agents should be utilized as well. Please remember all of your paralyzation agents. Do nothing for the patient's level of consciousness or pain. We should really consider having an alternative or a rescue airway. Um, must be available should attempts at an endotracheal intubation fail uh, after an RSI is initiated. Numerous commercial devices are available, and there's advantages and disadvantages to all of them. Combi tube, King Airway, an LMA, the list goes on. This ends part two. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, pretty easily contacted at roy.smith at redlandcc.edu or smithard.emsa.net. Thank you.